You know, if you look at the number of launches to space today, it's growing like, like crazy. We have more satellites than we've ever had before, more customers for those satellites. The economic value is incredible. More and more startup companies, small companies are getting into the launch business. And so as that happens, the price of launch comes down. And so those two things feed on each other. There's more opportunities to put payloads in space. Opportunities for the development of new experiments, new materials, new drugs. It gives us the opportunity for innovation and it opens the door for more companies to explore and innovate and build new capabilities that can positively impact the American way of life. Uh, we're definitely gonna see a continued growth of launch capability for a long time. Prices will continue to drop. It'll be more and more and more affordable to do business in space. And what that means is uh, space is getting more crowded. With so many new assets in space, we have to ask, what if something goes wrong? I think about space the way I think about the Australian outback, right? It's really hard to drive from one side of the desert to another. You know that if there's no place to stop, if you need extra tires, you need fuel, you need water, everything you need needs to be in your car at the start of that journey. That's the way we do outer space today. You gotta pack all that stuff with you. Traditionally, we launch a spacecraft never to touch it again. And it has a operational life, might be 10 years, 15 years, something like that. Having Space Force satellites that are able to protect and defend our assets from adversaries um, sometimes means that we need to move around. As we consume the fuel, that limits the life of our spacecraft. When you run out of fuel on your satellite, that's the end of your mission. Or if anything goes wrong, if a component fails, or if the payload becomes obsolete, there's nothing you can do. That satellite is up there and, and you can't touch it. That's what we do with space today, but there's a better way. What if we could extend the life, repair, refuel, and upgrade those spacecraft? If we did that, those satellites would be cheaper to maintain, it helps them return more data, and it helps improve the way that they are performing their mission. But servicing satellites in space isn't a new concept. From the beginning of America's space efforts, NASA foresaw a day when in-orbit satellite repair would not only be feasible, but routine. Perhaps the best example is from the Hubble Space Telescope servicing missions. Originally designed with a lifespan of 15 years, Hubble has flourished for over three decades thanks to astronaut-led servicing missions. Each mission extended Hubble's life and upgraded its capabilities, enabling groundbreaking discoveries that continue to shape our understanding of the universe today. Hubble is still the most prolific scientific instrument to date due to the fact that it was serviceable and upgradable. We want to take those lessons learned and apply them to other satellites. We want every satellite to have the opportunity to extend its life if it's still returning useful data. It's, it, it is something that has a rich history. And so one of the key things is those servicing activities you may have noticed were all humans and robots working together. So Hubble, for example, was a traditional servicing mission where you know Hubble needs to be repaired. You design your mission, you have the whole mission just for repairing the Hubble, and you launch it and go there and repair it, and then that's the end of the mission. I mean, that is a repair mission, but that is not a kind of sustainable way of doing that. In the past, we've used humans when it was a critical operation, it was something that had to get done, because humans are excellent at going up and providing the critical thinking to be able to execute some of these complex repairs and upgrades. The problem with using astronauts is it's dangerous. I mean, it's, it's expensive and it's dangerous. Oh, they, they need food and they need fuel and they need oxygen and, and they take up a lot of space. Robots don't have those same limitations, right? So if we take everything that we did with humans and we start figuring out how to do that with robots, then if, if something goes wrong, we can safely rely on some infrastructure that's already out there that can help you uh, to, to repair and, and uh, uh, continue the mission. If we do that, you can extend the life, repair, refuel, upgrade, maintain all of those spacecraft at lower cost than you can if you needed to use humans for each one. And that's entirely feasible. It's, this is not science fiction. This is stuff that we know how to do today.
2020, uh, our first mission extension vehicle successfully docked to a satellite in geosynchronous orbit to extend the life of these spacecraft that were running low on fuel. They clamp on and they remain attached, letting them put on five or 10 more years of operations before they are decommissioned. Once that life extension is completed, our mission extension vehicles undock and then they move on to their next client to extend the life for another client satellite. So it's a multiple use vehicle. These were the first vehicles to really begin doing in-space servicing, uh, which have really changed the paradigm, changed the environment here on Earth, creating a whole new market in space. Servicing satellites in orbit is just one part of the robotic revolution that's taking place in space right now. This, along with the assembly of large-scale structures and in-space manufacturing, are a suite of capabilities being developed called ISAM, In-Space Servicing, Assembly, and Manufacturing. One example of in-space uh, in assembly is for a large telescope. Um, it's impossible uh, to, to launch a huge telescope from the ground. First, the spacecraft that we launch are limited by the size of the launch fairing. To date, we have to fold these spacecraft up and do origami little deployments. Because they're limited by the size of the shipping container that it's going up in, basically. But think if we had the ability to assemble that in space with robots. And we take five launches and you launch small pieces on each of those and you assemble them in space and you get one large structure. We could double the size of James Webb Space Telescope. Think about the science we can do. All the new discoveries, it's just going to open up this whole world of possibilities that we just nobody ever thought was possible before. Can you make a big uh, habitat in space? Can you make you know, artificial gravity, rotating space stations, that, you know, that doesn't have to be science fiction when you start talking about assembly. And then there's the manufacturing in space for use in space. The big game changer in the long term will be local resource utilization, uh, rather than having to bring everything from Earth. Take one of the simplest things we want to do early on is to put a habitat on the moon and then shield the astronauts from dangerous radiation. We, we don't want to have to launch all that weight from Earth. We can use the dirt that's on the moon. Do we want astronauts out there with shovels, shoveling the dirt up? No, we want robots to go and pick up that dirt, put it into you know, an appropriate shielding form. It's hard to imagine expanding the human race into the solar system without the use of robotics. Humans can do things that robots will never be able to do, but robots can do the more repetitive things. So in-space manufacturing gives us the ability to adapt to whatever that situation may be. We just have to have the materials to be able to manufacture it in real time while they're up there. That's, that's just one example of why our robots are going to prove to be so valuable in this expansion of humanity into the solar system. So many of these things have been in development for a long time. What changed is there was a question that went out, what could we do for space infrastructure, right? Is there something that we can do in space that would create a leave behind capability that others could use for decades or generations to come? And so a joint interagency working group stood up. It was co-led by NASA and Department of Defense, and they created a vision for something called the Space Superhighway. It included logistics hubs at various locations in Earth orbit, each of which would be a destination, right? If you need fuel, there's a place to get it. If you need upgrades, there's a place to get it. If you break down, you can get towed to where you need to be, right? You've got multiple servicing providers for any spacecraft that needs those services. We could start building large structures in low Earth orbit in GEO or cislunar, and we can have tugs going between those. You can get fuel, you can get maintenance parts, repair your space vehicles, or you can set up a hotel. Uh, you, you use your imagination to, uh, to think of all the possibilities are. Again, almost like the highway system for cars, we can build a highway in space, right? When we do that, we enable a faster cadence of discovery, a faster cadence of science. And ultimately, it could enable us to uh, do more in space for less. If anyone is going to create this kind of space superhighway, it was going to be bigger than any one agency, 
is going to be bigger than any one company, and so Cosmic was stood up to provide a forum for that national level coordination. Cosmic is bringing together government, industry, and academia to collaborate on solutions and ways forward that benefit all of us. Cosmic is a nationwide consortium, so we have members from all over the country. There are startups in just about every state, universities in just about every state, who are members of Cosmic. ISAM is happening today all over the country with today's technologies, and it's not something that's decades in the future. So. You know, I, I believe that ISAM makes us more competitive. Um, I think it enables us to get new technologies in orbit faster, to be more flexible and resilient to unexpected things. It gives us the military advantage, it gives us the technological advantage over our adversaries. It just gives us a lot more options of how we can utilize what's up in space to our advantage and help us get that better understanding of, of, of space, our universe, and what's out there. And so I think that's something we can all benefit from. We're helping companies create new markets. And, and that's where the revenues are going to come from that are going to help us expand into the solar system. It is the most exciting time in space right now because it's new, whole new market in space is, is, is emerging. Space is going to be really the, the next frontier uh, for the human race. We're going to see life getting better and better because of what uh, the space economy can bring back to the Earth. New scientific knowledge, new materials, new capabilities, new products will be developed. And that's a huge opportunity. The other dimension is the human dimension. If, if the cost of launch continues to go down, you know, I or you, or you know, at least our kids, um, we might have the opportunity to go see Earth from space. What a, what a cool thing that would be. You, you don't get to that future without expanding on this capabilities. The idea that once you've seen our planet from space and to see the beauty, the fragility, you're, you can never forget that sight. You're changed forever and it's going to be a better world because we're all in this together.